but it is really exciting to be able to meet in person and to see you all and to see so many friends this week. Um, welcome to the China Coalition's event, uh, Boycotting the Beijing Olympics. My name is Logan Carmichael, and I am the Advocacy Director for China Aid and also the Chair of this coalition. The Coalition to Advance Religious Freedom in China, or just China Coalition, is an offshoot of the International Religious Freedom Roundtable and is a diverse group of NGOs united to promote the universal right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion for all people in China. To date, we have 22 organizations as official participants, representing Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners, the Church of Almighty God, the Underground House Church, and more. Religious persecution in China hardly needs an introduction today. Under the rule of President Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party is implementing an ongoing campaign to synthesize religion, that is, to remake religion to be aligned with Communist Party ideals, which has left no religion untouched. We are now seeing portraits of Jesus being replaced with those of Mao or Xi, Uyghurs in East Turkestan being put in re-education camps for having beards or Qurans in their house, reports of mass organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners, and the silencing of Tibetan Buddhists in the exile of the Dalai Lama. The massive crackdown in China has been escalating for decades, so sadly, no sign of slowing down. Despite this, China will be hosting the Beijing Winter Olympics in 2022. With the full knowledge of the systematic gross human rights abuses, the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, has decided to give the Chinese government diplomatic legitimacy in naming them as host of the worldwide event. This has outraged persecution survivors, human rights activists, and politicians. Today, our distinguished panelists will introduce various campaigns that are seeking to bring human rights into the discussion of, of the Olympics in Beijing. While the China Coalition will not endorse any one campaign, our aim is to inform and empower all those listening to get involved in calling for religious freedom in China, including in the Olympics. But before I get into the discussion, I wanted to point out that on the programs that are on the end of the tables, there will be a QR code on the back that will link to eight different op-eds by various members of our coalition that have been published or have yet to be published in various national newspapers. Um, these will give you a deep insight into what the persecution of each group would look like. Um, it also points you to the summit, and we're excited to be here today. And also, Kate will be coming down the aisles distributing cards if anyone has any questions, uh, you may write it down and we'll have a Q&A with the panelists after that. So I'm thrilled to first introduce Rushan Abbas, Founder and Executive Director of the Campaign for Uyghurs, who will speak on the impact of the 2008 Beijing Olympics on human rights advocates. She is a fierce advocate for her sister, for her heritage, and for all Uyghur people. Rushan. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, the China Coalition, for putting together this great event with uh, such a esteemed panelists here. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for coming. Since the 2008 Olympics, so much has happened that it's difficult to even recall those times. The CCP has widely expanded its brutalities to an active genocide in Turkestan. Tibet, Hong Kong, and the southern Mongolia are all seeing their rights and the liberties curtailed. What final wake-up call is needed for the international community? Back then, the world did not pay much attention to what was going on in our communities, and we were largely regarded as a nuisance, dampening the celebratory mood. As we near 2022, I recall how the 2008 torch relay offered an opportunity to protest those games, which were being held in the face of widespread repression and brutalities. I stood together with my fellow Uyghur Americans, Tibetans, Southern Mongolians, and the Chinese Democrats who protested in San Francisco. At the time, 
pro-CCP protesters hit us with red communist flag poles and the police officers, our police officers, did not protect us. Uyghurs have always been viewed as an obstacle to China's larger colonialist goals. Now I have known so many people who have become casualties of their genocidal campaign. My own sister, my in-laws, and my friends, my professors, my relatives, are all out of reach because of the CCP does not view them as human. In 2018, my sister was taken by the CCP and the place placed in prison as a retaliation for my activism. As an American citizen, my advocacy work here in America caused the freedom of my sister. I spoke at the Hudson Institute on September 5th, 2018, and I talked about the concentration camps and the CCP's genocidal policies in our homeland, outlining my in-law's fate. Six days after that speech, my sister, Dr. Gushiana Bas, and my aunt, they both were abducted the same day from two different cities, about 900 miles away from each other. A peaceful, law-binding, non-political, retired medical doctor. This was to teach me a lesson for speaking out on the CCP's concentration camps and the genocidal policies against the Uyghurs and the other people in East Turkestan. And now, again, the Olympics will come to Beijing while it seems the international community slowly is coming to understand that CCP is an actor who prizes its own expansion above all else. We have lived with this reality for decades. Now, the world is as well. A growing number of countries have designated the Uyghur genocide as exactly what it is. But where is, but there is still no widespread boycott of the 2022 Beijing Olympics. Campaign Uyghurs, in conjunction with the Peace Project, the Jewish World Watch, and the Jewish Movement for Uyghur Freedom, has launched the Berlin-Beijing campaign, which links the 2022 Olympic Games to those held in 1936 in Berlin, as the Holocaust was beginning. These similarities are shocking, and we cannot allow these games to affirm yet another genocidal regime. We must break up to put forth a worldwide rejection of the brutality of the CCP, showing that we are united in our opposition to this regime. Please, for the future of all humanity, Boycott Beijing 2022. Thank you. Thank you, John, for continuing to speak out for your family and uh, just your bravery and the consequences that have come, come from that. Uh, next, I will briefly introduce the project. Olivia, I'll pass it to you now. Um, thank you so much, Logan, for organizing this and the China Coalition for pulling together this event. I think this is a really great opportunity for all of us to discuss the range of options that we have to respond to Beijing's selection by the International Olympic Committee to host the Olympics, in spite of the fact, as Rashan pointed out, that genocide and crimes against humanity not only happened, 
but are actually ongoing today. Um, so in response to this uh, at Heritage, I put out a report called A Strong U.S. Response to the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. And I'm going to outline some of the policy steps that we think would be wise um, in response to Beijing's selection. And I think one thing to bear in mind um, in terms of the recommendations that were made is that there's not only a role for the U.S. government to respond, but there's also a role for civil society to respond and for the business community to respond in the face of the Olympics taking place. So Heritage's primary position is that we should postpone the 2022 Olympics for the purposes of selecting a new host for the Winter Olympics. Um, the idea behind it is that there's the Biden administration has placed a really strong emphasis on um, multilateral action, especially um, with the international community working in concert with each other. We've seen examples of this, for example, with the EU, the United Kingdom, Canada, um, and the US taking steps to hold China accountable for the atrocities in Xinjiang. And we think that an international coalition made up of those actors, plus some of the US allies in Asia, like Japan, Korea, Australia, India, and others, could actually form enough pressure, enough political momentum, that the International Olympic Committee might decide to make a different decision and not continue with Beijing as host. Part of the reason why we think that it could be possible to postpone the Olympics is because uh, the Tokyo Olympics were originally slated to be hosted in 2020. And within four months of the original date for the Olympics, there was a decision made to postpone Tokyo Olympics, obviously, until this summer. And so if there's enough political momentum, there's already precedent for postponing the Olympics for the purposes of selecting a new host country. We sort of laid out a secondary line of action. If you can't form an international coalition, if you can't form enough uh, political pressure in order to postpone and move, the second best option would be to engage in a diplomatic boycott and to make diplomatic participation contingent on gaining access to the camps inside of Xinjiang. Um, and so this would be definitely a secondary option. We would see it as a second best to postponing and moving, but a potential option if we get too close to the Olympics and we see a lack of action on the part of the Biden administration and the international community. Um, as I mentioned, beyond government action, there's a significant role for civil society to play whether or not Beijing continues to serve as host or not. And that would be, um, first, we see a precedent for athlete uh, boycotts or demonstrations in the Olympics um, in, in, in the past. Um, for example, with apartheid um, in South Africa, there were individual teams that made the decision to uh, voice their disapproval even though they were participating in the Olympics or individual teams that chose not to participate. And we believe that athletes have the right to do that. We also believe that journalists need to increase their coverage of the severe human rights violations that are happening in China today. That's not only coverage of the genocide and crimes against humanity that are taking place against Uyghurs, but also religious persecution, um, the targeting of Tibetans, Falun Gong, Christians, Catholics, etc. And that there needs to be a consistent drumbeat from American media and from international media highlighting the severe human rights violations that are ongoing today. Finally, um, there's a role for the business community to play. I've heard it said that um, the Olympics is really a money-making venture, and so the reason why it continues to be held is because it's profitable. And so businesses have the option, um, and especially broadcasters have the option to decide to, for example, forego um, broadcasting the opening games, uh, the opening ceremonies of the games, which are so often uh, known as a propaganda mechanism, and certainly were a propaganda mechanism during the 2008 Olympics. And so NBC should make a decision about whether it's it or not it's actually going to grant a platform um, to Beijing to continue to propagandize about their government, their system, and the repressions that they carry out. But also individual advertisers have a choice about whether or not they're going to give advertising revenue as well to these games. And so I think there is a truly a role for everyone, government, civil society, the business community, to make our concerns known uh, both to Congress and to the executive branch. And I think the ideal situation would be to postpone and to move the games. Um, thank you.
infanticide, systematic rape. And one of the things that they do in the camps is, uh, I read an account where a young woman was being raped in, in the camp. It was, a, it was a gang rape, which is horrific enough that they brought like a hundred of the other women to the camp and forced them to watch this. And then they were watching those women to see if anyone flinched, to see if anyone cried, to see if anyone looked away. And if they did, they would be the next ones. This is evil. And Alec Pershawn said, what does it take to say you don't have the honor of hosting the Olympic Games? We know what they're doing. So we are responsible to take action. Not only are we morally responsible, we, but we are also <coughs> legally responsible because the United States and about, a, about 150 other countries are signatories to the Genocide Convention, where we said never again for the Holocaust. Under the Genocide Convention, we have obligated ourselves to prevent and punish genocide. Boycotting the, the, the Olympic Games is, 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 is even just kind of a slap on the wrist, really, to, to what we really need to do to, to prevent and punish a genocide. So I believe that, um, I don't, that a diplomatic boycott is even less of a, of a slap on the wrist. I think that a full boycott is called for. We're, we are calling on the U.S. Olympics Committee and on the International Olympics Committee to move the games, and I agree with the idea, you know, it would be wonderful if they would actually stand up to China and say, look, we're delaying these games, we're gonna rebid this, and we're gonna uh, have the games in a, a venue that's not committing genocide. I, 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 I tend to think, I can't imagine that the International Olympics Committee is gonna do that. So then what are we left with? If we do a, a diplomatic boycott, then what that means is that the, that the athletes are still going to be competing, which means that there's still going to be this, this glorious opening ceremony, which means that the Chinese Communist Party is still going to be able to use this as a, a, a way of, um, of legitimating itself. And, and it's a way of the world saying to them, you know, we do know that you're committing genocide. I mean, we have officially determined that you are, but that's okay. We'll send our athletes anyway, and we'll, we'll give you this huge pro propaganda bonanza. And then who knows what the heck they're going to do? I mean, where, where do they go from here? I, I shudder to think about it. So I, and then also the Committee on Press and Danger China and a number of other organizations have gotten together and we have launched an initiative and you can find it at genocidegames.org, genocidegames.org. Um, and we have a, an open letter there where there's 110 uh, signatories of influencers uh, and then there was there was a a, a, um, a, a uh, congressional hearing in which I testified in in, in May uh, that we should move or boycott the games. But I, I would go beyond that. I would say that um, just as South Africa was um, banned from the games because of apartheid, I think China should be banned from the games because of genocide. Ban China for genocide. And not only that, we've been talking so far about the internal uh, Chinese uh, oppression of its own citizens. What about what they've done to the world? What about the fact that they unleashed the coronavirus on the world, which has killed approximately 3 million people, 600,000 in the United States? What about the fact that they're flooding our shores with fentanyl, which is killing people? I have a friend whose two sons died of a fentanyl overdose. What about the untold billions of dollars that they are stealing uh, in intellectual property? I think that they should be declared to be a transnational criminal organization and that we and the rest of the world should um, end all uh, diplomatic and economic ties. Thank you. Is this yes. working? Hi, I'm 
Candace Bryan Abbey with the Atlantis Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, and I'm actually here on behalf of the Empty Box Campaign, which is a joint campaign between the Human Rights Foundation and the Lantos Foundation. Uh, I am especially grateful to Logan and the China Coalition for having us here today, because our Olympics idea is a little out of the box um, as it relates directly to Beijing, and I'd like to start my remarks with the video if Logan could be my technology right now. There's no argument to be made 
from the IOC that the athletes are damaged by not having their brutal dictator in the stands to wave to them. Um, so it was important for us to make sure that all those arguments that the IOC gives, whether it's, you know, we've already built the stadium or we can't move it or the logistics are hard, those are all taken away with the empty box campaign. But it sends such a message, and I agree with so much of what Olivia said about it's not just, that there's more than just the IOC that should be responsible for this, right? NBC could choose not to cover dictators in the box. They could choose, you know, Lukashenko's not going to be there this year because the IOC did, did see fit to ban him. Um, but, you know, he's notorious over the years for being there waving with his son. Um, and instead of just showing a picture of him with a cute little boy, you know, 15 years ago, they could have said, this is what he does. So they have, a, they have an obligation to, if they're going to cover it, to cover both sides of it. Um, obviously the sponsors have a, we think, have an obligation to decide whether or not they're going to run commercials um, in the opening ceremony. So there's a lot of ways that we think we can put pressure on the IOC to actually do this, it, not for Tokyo, um, but in Beijing and beyond. So thank you so much for including us. Well, thanks so much. Thanks, Logan, of course, and the China Coalition for inviting me and to all my panelists as well. Um, I, mean, I, I agree with almost everything that the panelists have already said, but I want to key in on one thing. Well, first, I'm going to say that from UHRP's perspective, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, I think, in principle, we do support boycotts. There, there is really no other situation in which would, would uh, require a boycott than genocide or even call it crimes against humanity, atrocity crimes. Uh, there should not be an to take place in China. Issue as panelists have identified is with the IOC. I think we can agree on one thing: is that the IOC is pretty horrendous. They are unresponsive. They just don't want to take any steps to ameliorate the situation. So I started a couple of years ago with uh, Weaver Allies as well. This campaign called No Race, No Game. This is actually two years ago. Uh, next week, so we identified and Weaver activists like Bushman and others were around in 2008. They knew it would happen, uh, and we, we thought okay, we should probably start showing up now. This is one year from what the scheduled Tokyo Games would have started. Essentially, what we're calling for you no know, rights to the games is conditional if you close the camps and you respect Uyghur rights and have the games. If not, well, then no. The IOC needs to take action. Of course, that nothing's really happened. The IOC has been totally unresponsive so far. So I think it's important to understand the context around the IOC um, because I think there is something in terms of the campaign that we're running and all the groups are running is to really push the IOC into a corner as far as possible because they actually have been responsive when they're forced to act in certain situations and we'll get to when they act. Um, so they have a real problem in terms of actually hosting the games in countries that are not authoritarian. Uh, you see the bidding process for the 2022 games, for example, uh, Germany, uh, Switzerland, Poland, Sweden, Norway, they all pulled out because the domestic population said, no, we don't want to do this. Because of a number of things, cost overruns, the militarization of public space, surveillance, um, Greenwashing, for example, uh, evictions, pushing people out of public spaces. The, these, these populations just don't want the game school for because they just cost a lot of money and they bring basically nothing to the community. We see over and time and again cost overruns. I mean, Tokyo was way over budget. It cost between two and six billion dollars to push the game back a year. Uh, so that's, I think, a consideration in terms of asking for them to push it back is that that's going to be a problem because the IOC is not going to like having to push the games back again. It's just, it's just a loss of money, and money is central. So where, where are the pressure points, I think? These have been identified already. You have, of course, the sponsors. The IOC has a, a sustainability code. They actually have a sourcing code on the game. It's not for Beijing, but for all of their games. And in the sustainability code, it says that you cannot be uh, sourcing goods that are made with forced labor for the games. Very clear. Forced labor is widespread and state-sponsored in the Uyghur region. We serve in China today. Or to ensure the broadcasters are not supporting surveillance companies, for example supporting financially surveillance com technology companies who are directly complicit in what's happening in the Uyghur region. Secondly, broadcasters, yes. NBC, Eurosport are the biggest financial contributors to games by far. NBC will provide over a billion dollars to these games, and they're not going to be very happy if the games get pushed back. They want people to go for it because they make a lot of money, and also the sponsors make money from, of course, the broadcasters broadcasting their advertising. Right? But I think there's two things I want to focus on quickly. 
And that's athletes and journalists, and it's been touched upon already. So athletes actually have some power here. The U.S. Olympic Committee said that they will not punish athletes if they speak out, if they break essentially Rule 50, which is what the IOC has in terms of uh, disciplining athletes for speaking out. So the U.S. Olympic Committee said we're not going to discipline athletes. So that's one thing. IOC around Tokyo announced more recently that actually they're going to relax that rule and say that athletes are going to be able to speak out, not on the field of play or podium, but before the games take place, they can, they can do it only in the locker room or just in like the, the area where they come out to field of play, press conferences, social media. But I think that brings up one point, is that the IOC hasn't said what's going to happen if someone, for example, an American <coughs> athlete or a Canadian athlete or someone else, has a shirt that says free week for the and they wear it to a press conference, or they tweet. Uh, I'm really concerned about what's happening in Xinjiang, East Turkestan. The IOC is very opaque about what's actually going to happen. Are they going to be arrested for doing this? Are they going to succumb to the Chinese government pressure to arrest these people for what an ordinary Chinese citizen or a Uyghur would be arrested for if they did this? They would be, you know, put in jail for life for wearing a free Uyghur t-shirt, for example. So I think that's an answer that we need to push from the IOC on. Journalists as well, I think, journalists, there's also uncertainty around to what extent can journalists actually cover the games and be critical of the government. There's a reporting tool that uh, that was developed with the committee for, to protect journalists and the IOC saying that we can actually lodge press freedom violations during the games. How is the IOC actually going to take these in? Okay, we have journalists lodge the press freedom violation and then it goes to the IOC and what are they going to do about it? What if a journalist is detained? What is the IOC going to do about it? Are they in a position, for example, to actually uh, uh, respond to this? And now you might criticize these points and say, well, this just seems like minutia. This is not actually, I mean, you're being really naive. There's actually these small policies that the yeah, IOC is certainly not going to actually do anything on. And that gets me to my last point. And I would make one point before this. Thomas Bach last week spoke at the Human Rights Council and was very defensive, very, very defensive about the mix of sport and politics. That's what they gammer on about all the time. But he was very uh, defensive of the fact that people were speaking about boycott. And that's really good. It's good to see that kind of pressure. But again, the main point I want to make is that, okay, uh, and you had mentioned, what is the IOC's job here? The IOC actually has a job. Um, their job, in some ways, and what they have been responding to in the past, with past games, they respond, and you mentioned Luke Schenken, that's a good point. And you can even have a Apartheid was mentioned as well. There's an Iranian wrestler who is sentenced to death. They respond in these cases because they have an obligation to respond, because in the case of Lukashenko, he's the president of Belarus, of course, but he's also the president of the IOC. And that's why they took action. That's why they banned it from the games, right? So that's where the direct connection is. They felt that they needed to act. Apartheid, you know, a bit further back in history, of course, but I think sometimes, uh, you get a little bit of the details of Brown Apartheid. Why did the IOC uh, push out South Africa, expelled from the game for 30 years. Well, firstly, Avery Brundage, who was the IOC president at the time, I mean, he, he was a well-known racist and anti-Semite. He was nicknamed uh, Slavery Avery. He was awful. He didn't actually want to push them out, the IOC members, and more importantly, the governments in Africa said, we're not going to participate in the games and several other governments if you allow South Africa to participate. And the IOC was pressuring us. But the main reason why they were actually pushed out is because South Africa was not allowing mixed competition with that black and white athletes. That was the direct connection which forced, in some ways, the IOC to take action because there was a direct connection between sport and discrimination and the Olympics. So that's that's why, in some in some ways, again, political pressure was important too. But that's definitely one of the reasons why they were pushed out. And this matters, I think, because we need to figure out um, or we need to we actually hold them to account on issues where they've actually suggested that they are uh, accountable for, they have obligations for. Again, athletes. Protection, journalist protection. Again, it, it, this, this might not save the world. It might not actually solve the crisis necessarily, but there are avenues of which we can actually push the IOC. Um, and just to wrap up, yeah, I think uh, Thomas Bach of the Human Rights Council said something. Just a quote. He said that human rights issues is not our job. The IOC's job to solve this. This is your job. He said you are the ones who have to solve these. So, meaning, I suppose individuals, civil society, the athletes. I agree. With them. I think that actually is our role as civil society to push back on this and to corner them as much as possible. I think, although again, I do support boycotts, diplomatic boycotts at the very least, or they could at least set a foundation for further action and send a signal that we're not okay with the games. But I think that there are some avenues in which we can actually push the IOC into a corner and, and force them to act because these issues in the country are actually related to what's happening in Beijing in 2022. Um, I'll leave it there. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so just a reminder, Kate will be going around and collecting the note cards if you want to submit any questions for the panelists. We'll try 
um, to get through all of them. Um, but right now, I have a few questions for you all. And so the majority of the panelists have acknowledged the IOC's reaction, or mainly lack of reaction, um, to human rights when it comes to the Olympic Games. But I want to ask um, what we kind of can expect from China's response to any of these campaigns. Um, many countries have mentioned or are considering or are in the process of voting on different motions in order to consider either a diplomatic or outright boycott. Um, the UK actually has a motion going to vote this Thursday um, on exactly one of these things. And so I want to ask, even when the Canadian Parliament recently announced that they were considering a boycott, the Chinese government promised to retaliate against all countries who do so. Um, so uh, open to any of the panelists, what can we expect of this retaliation that's been promised by China? Sorry, you'll have to pass the microphone back and forth. <laughs> um, I think retaliation should be expected, um, but I think that this is one of the benefits of forming an international coalition where everybody has everybody's back. Because China may retaliate economically, I'm thinking of one example in the South Korean context, um, South Korea supported U.S. deployment of a specific missile system um, and it ended up putting it in place in South Korea. And when South Korea sort of agreed to that, um, they actually faced um, some economic consequences. China uh, was encouraging citizens not to travel to South Korea and not to buy South Korean goods. Um, so these types of things do happen. But the actual impact on South Korea was somewhat blunted by the fact that they had such a strong alliance with the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are ways to use the fact that the US has a really strong alliance system, not only in Asia, but in Europe and across the globe, to sort of blunt some of those impacts. And so I think we should be worried less about China's response. I think we can count on China's response and that it will be negative. But I think we should be focused more on sending a really strong signal that there's a unified effort in an opposition, um, not only to China hosting, but to the myriad human rights violations that they continue to commit day in and day out. Um, just to add to that, so if, if a country is going to try to hold China accountable for its genocide, perhaps boycott games, of course China is going to retaliate, perhaps in the way that they've been retaliating against um, Australia and just hitting them with all kinds of uh, trade war and tariffs, cutting off trade relationships and trying to cripple them economically. And to me, what this says, it just highlights our need to decouple from the Chinese Communist Party. We need to stop being so intertwined with them in trade and also especially in our supply chains. I mean, what if, what if we are dependent on them for our, 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 our pharmaceuticals? You know, they could just say, okay, you want to work on the Olympics? We're going to stop making your, you know, antibiotics or whatever else it is. Or military supply chains. It's just that they are a, a, a vicious, retaliatory regime and we just need to get away from them and decouple with them. Yeah, Olivia and the uh, Reggie put uh, a very important uh, emphasis on uh, what needs to be done. So if the Chinese regime is going to act like a barbaric uh, some uh, criminal organization and they uh, try to threat the countries uh, who are talking about boycotting, then hit China where it hurts the most. As Ruiji said, decouple and boycott and do not continue to enable China's economy to murder more people because Uyghur people are dying. And every country who are signing up for the Belt and Road Initiative and continue to do business with China, supporting China, are complicit with this genocide. It really frustrates me as somebody who actually facing the China's retaliation as an individual. I look at Hollywood celebrities, I look at NBA, and all these famous and the uh, people who are supposed to be very vocal against any kind of social injustice. Where are they? 
when the Uyghur women are facing government-sponsored mass rape. Where are they? All these children, you know, the activists and the, uh, the celebrities who are supposed to protect the young children. More than a million Uyghur children are abducted from their families. So a country like China is being supported by the international communities and any country is sending the delegation or the ethnic to this genocidal game should be counted as uh, complicit in this genocide. Thank you. Um, and actually that, Michelle, was a great transition to one of the questions that was asked by the audience who says, who can hold the ROC legally accountable? Has there been any legal action taken against the IOC for violations of UN Declaration of Human Rights? As far as I don't know, one point to make is that actually the IOC is a, is a has a sort of observer status at the UN. I mean, they, they actually, that's why people like Thomas Bach, who's the IOC president right now, spoke at the UN Human Rights Council because they, in, you know, rhetorically at least, they suggest that they're supportive of human rights. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of holding them legally accountable, I suppose the question would be to what? I mean, <laughs> Beijing is held the game, we have all these countries who are, who are at least principle right now supporting them. So I think it would be a hard legal case to make, at least my perspective. So even though it's really difficult to hold the IOC directly accountable, we have a unique situation here in the U.S. where the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee is the only uh, committee that is federally chartered, which means that it's actually privately run, but it's overseen by Congress. And there are some steps and actual requirements um, for Congress to have oversight over the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Um, in the past, there have been suggestions like uh, the potential to revoke their um, tax-exempt status um, and also to pull um, certain elements of their charter. And so even though that can't get directly at the IOC, because the U.S. is such an important player at the Olympics, um, taking punitive action against the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee for permitting the IOC to select Beijing may actually be a possibility for accountability. Um, but I think it's worth looking into, and I think that there should be lessons learned um, clearly from Berlin, also from um, the Soviet Union uh, boycott, and just past present, the 2008 Olympics, and now, of course, the 2022 Olympics. Um, that the fact that the IOC remains virtually impervious to international pressure is something that demands a remedy. And so policymakers all across the globe need to be looking for ways to increase accountability for the IOC and examining whether the UN is a potential route, whether um, there are sanctions authorities that we might be able to use. Um, and I think that those are the types of things that we need policymakers here in Washington, but also in capitals all across the globe to be thinking more seriously about. Great. My next question is actually just hours ago, there's recent development in how the U.S. is responding to the boycott. Um, an amendment submitted by Representative Chris Smith um, in the House Foreign Relations Committee, which would require a strategy by the Biden administration to engage at the IOC on moving the 2022 Winter Olympics to a venue in a different country, um, was unfortunately not passed by a vote of 21 to 26. Um, so with this in mind, What's next for the U.S.? What are the next best steps also for us as everyone in this room as advocates in order to engage the U.S. government in these Olympic boycotts, whether a whole, whether it's a location change, whether it's a diplomatic boycott? So I started to say something on the last oh, one. Sorry. I don't know. It's totally fine. But, you know, one of the things that we've heard a lot from the IOC, and I think the U.S. does have a role here, and, um, and I'm sure that that Peter's heard it as well, is, you know, we're not political. We don't want to be political, right? We've all heard it. I mean, and and I understand where they're coming from in that once the games are decided that, you know, they want to stay out of the fray on, on it. I, from the perspectives that you share here. But the bottom line is it is political when they choose Beijing. It is political when they choose Russia, you know, and it's political when they decide not to not to enforce their own charter, 
their own charter that says the goal of Olympism is to place sport at the service of the harmonious development of humankind with a view to promoting a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. I think they do have an obligation to consider human rights in their games. And you know, if you look at the last 100 years of Olympic history, 100 years ago, they did a lot of political um, bans on countries that had violated the pieces of the charter that I just read. You know, apartheid, yes, there was, was more complicated because there was, there was the athlete impact. But what about when they banned countries for being part of World War I or part of World War II? Or, you know, it was beyond South Africa that was banned for, for apartheid. There were other things. They chose to make political statements a long time ago. The political statements they've made in the last 20 years are choosing Beijing twice, choosing Russia, and only banning countries for doping. And I think the US and other countries that you know are global leaders do have something, do have pressure points for them to make them make better decisions, enforce their own charter, and live up to the standards that they've set for these games. I just wanted to add something really quick to Candace's point. Um, in 2017, the IOC agreed to accede to, and I put this in my report, but the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. But these compliance measures aren't supposed to take place until 2024 Olympics. This makes no sense. They are fully aware of the human rights principles that are present and have literally no excuse for selecting Beijing as host but they are purposefully choosing to defer adherence to international human rights norms for whatever reason they have decided. Start with adherence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty unbelievable that that's the case today. No, sorry to interrupt you, Candice. No, um, but now we'll, we can shift back now. Um, so what's next for advocating in the US for any of these Olympic campaigns? How do we best engage with the US government in order for them to acknowledge the gross human rights abuses in the Olympic uh, being held in Beijing? I mean, I think the first thing, um, the first thing, so this last week, the European Parliament voted on a, on a motion that said that the European states should not, um, at least they should not be sending diplomats or political representatives to the games, or they should be declining any kind of uh, invitation to the games. It's actually a kind of a big thing. Um, so we'll see to what extent the, this motion is actually going to influence some of these member states. I think the first thing, of course, is I think the U.S., as soon as possible, needs to recognize or to say that we're going to also commit a diplomat. The rest of the world is, has trouble sort of keeping up because they just can't stick their necks out. You know, they're, they're worried about the retaliation. Retaliation is important to keep in mind. You know, I don't really care what China does in response, but it is relevant in terms of other states who are a little bit more vulnerable. So the U.S. as soon as possible absolutely needs to commit to a diplomatic boycott. That seems very simple. Hey, there's genocide taking place in the country in which uh, the Olympics are, are happening. We're not going to send officials. We're not going to signal that the games are actually legitimate. Right? So I think the sooner they do that, the better, because then you can get other states to sign on. Sim similar to what happened in the genocide motions and the resolutions around the world, the U.S. led on this, and you've got subsequent uh, motions or resolutions from other countries, Canada, Netherlands, Belgium, and the U.K., looking like the Czech Republic. Uh, so I think that's the first step, certainly, and then we can sort of speak about other things like, you know, how do you address American e pop sponsors for the Olympics, or uh, NBC, obviously, is something as well. So I think that's certainly the first thing they should do. So, I guess, I so as I mentioned, there was a, a, uh, a congressional hearing on this topic in uh, May, and something that really struck me was that Everyone there was in favor of at least a diplomatic boycott. So Nancy Pelosi, as Speaker of the House, took the extremely unusual step of being a witness in that hearing. And she said, you know, how can she acknowledged that no one denied that the genocide was, was occurring. And she said, how can our senior officials come and, um, and, and sit there and watch the games and watch the opening ceremonies, knowing that at that moment, genocide is happening. So 
you know, it, it seems to me that everybody's in agreement about at least a diplomatic boycott. So I guess that, that the Chris Smith um, motion was to to ask the Biden administration to commit to moving the game. Maybe that's a higher bar. Um, at least we should have agreement that there's a diplomatic boycott. And then I think that if there's a groundswell of support for a complete boycott, which is where we stand, if it's not, if it's not, if it can't be moved, we, we should completely boycott. Um, you know, I think that, that, that regular rank and file citizens like us need to take responsibility. So in the genocide games, we've got a petition. You can go to genocidegames.org, sign the petition saying that, 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 that the uh, game should be moved or boycotted. And then we also had a big rally today, and Rashawn Abbas you know, spoke at it. We're just people who are out there trying to build a political will to move or boycott the games. And this is something that anyone can do. And just briefly, we've never taken the advice of Thomas Bach again. He wants us to get out there and actually support human rights. We're going to do it. Um, but in terms of, I think, in the context of the IOC choosing Beijing, it's important to recognize that they, they just want to get through this. And that's why I think moving the games is tricky, again, firstly because of the cost. Um, they pushed the Japanese, the Tokyo games back already, and it's cost several billion dollars. They just want to get through Tokyo. They just want to get through Beijing. They want to stick their heads in the sand, and then it's sort of smooth sailing with Paris, and then LA, and then Milan afterwards. But then Beijing is also a contender for 2032, so, so what do you do? But, you know, so I think it's important to recognize that. And that's why I mentioned that there's falling some public support for the games in Western countries, because people just don't want them anymore. So the, the IOC is very afraid of what's happening. Um, so if they get to these games, it's not smooth sailing beyond that. But I think that's something to keep in mind. They just will reject everything you say until there's more But our point with the empty box campaign is that it's Yes, it is horrible that they gave it to Beijing, but there is an opportunity every two years for the IOC to respect their charter, respect their role on the world stage, and the stage that they allow people to join them on and stand up for human rights. Whether it's Paris or Milan or LA or Tokyo, there are going to be people there that do not respect human rights. A couple of years ago, she stole the show. She stole the headlines. That's not okay. She shouldn't have been there. So, so another plug for the empty box. But, but that's it. It shouldn't just be empty, or it shouldn't be smooth sailing just because the host country is a is a good, you know, a good global citizen. One of the questions from the audience says. Clearly from proceedings like the G7, other allied liberal democracies are not willing to take a meaningful stand against China. Can we hold China accountable if our allies are not with us? So both Peter, you acknowledged that it's harder for a lot of countries to put their neck out similar to the US due to the power structure. And then Olivia, you've also mentioned um, a broad coalition of countries. So if you can touch on what that could look like and what that would possibly impact in, in your campaigns. I mean, just really briefly, actually, one idea is that I think if you actually do a good collective action from governments on the Olympics, you could actually use this in some ways as a springboard to push back on other things that are happening. So the games are going to happen, and then they're going to end. Okay, but then what do you do afterwards? So I think actually in some ways this could be serves as a foundation for additional effort for going forward. Again, diplomatic boycotts seems like an easy one. I mean, don't send politicians to a, to a country where genocide is taking place. Yeah, so that's my take. I think it could be used as a springboard for action for further action. I think that um, we already have a really strong basis of allies that have stepped up to hold China accountable. The fact that we saw um, specific sanctions against China in concert, principally led by the U.S. I think Peter made a really good point that a lot of countries won't come along if the U.S. isn't in the right place on this. And so I think that's why it's been frustrating to see relative uh, silence or, or quietness from the Biden administration when it comes to doing this issue um, and to addressing the Olympics. But we, we have seen the Biden administration getting the European Union on board, getting Canada on board, getting the UK on board in order to issue sanctions. And so why not start with that coalition first? Um, we see how even quiet diplomacy behind closed doors can do a lot. Um, to get people to come to the table. And I think that we already have a recognition throughout Asia 
that there's a battle over values being waged in Asia. And so I think that we have allies um, like Japan, like Korea, who could be brought on board if they saw the US, the EU, Canada, the UK, and others saying, you know what, we would like to press for the games to be postponed for the purposes of moving. Or I even saw a creative idea from Project 2049 Institute, Randy Schreiber, who is the former um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia under the Trump administration, put out a report in concert with his colleagues saying, Maybe there's an elegant solution to this idea of uh, moving the games. Maybe you don't have to postpone. Maybe Japan already has the uh, architecture and the infrastructure from having hosted the Olympic Games, actually, uh, winter games before, and of course, um, summer games coming up now, that you might just be able to offer it to Japan. So I think we have to be open to creative ideas like this, um, and that would certainly engage with our allies in a, in a pretty meaningful way. All right, we're quickly running out of time, and so I want to give the opportunity to the panelists to tell the audience how to get involved with your campaign one last time. Uh, Rashawn, if you'd like to start. If you go visit our website, campaignforweavers.org, and the, uh, also uh, Berlin to uh, Beijing uh, uh, campaign, uh, there is a advocacy uh, resource tab, and you can get involved with the uh, different uh, kind of campaigns we have. And the, uh, just uh, take action, educate the people around you, and be vocal. You don't have to be activists, you don't have to be Uyghur. To speak out for Uyghur people, and do it, not just to save the Uyghur people, but save the future of this world. Thank you. I agree with Rushan. There, there shouldn't be a single person in America who doesn't know who the Uyghurs are and doesn't know that there are between 1.8 and 3 million Uyghurs currently held political re-education camps. And there shouldn't be a single person in America who doesn't know that the Chinese Communist Party is carrying out severe human rights violations and does not respect or protect the human rights of its citizens. Um, I don't have a campaign, we don't have a campaign at Heritage ongoing, but if you're interested in looking um, at the report, it is called A Strong U.S. Response to the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, um, and it can be found at heritage.org, along with several other uh, resources and papers on China. And I will just plug one other thing. We just released last week um, something called the China Transparency Report. It highlights actually the work of a lot of folks who are at this table who are doing um, a significant effort to peel back um, all of the attempts that the Chinese Communist Party has made to conceal critical information about human rights, military, economy, etc. And so hopefully this can serve as a, a resource to those of us doing research or just wanting to be educated. Um, and that's the China Transparency Report. It's available on our website. So for us, um, my, my website is womensrights.frontiers.org. That's where we fight forced abortion and sex-selective abortion of baby girls. We have a couple campaigns there uh, to save baby girls and also to save abandoned widows. But specific to the genocide games, we've got um, a website called genocidegames.org. And it's, it's just 100% dedicated to moving or boycotting the games. And uh, we would love it if you would sign the petition and share it, because that's a way that we can take that uh, those signatures and the number of the signatures and go to the IOC, go to the USO city, and say, look, people really want to move or boycott these games. So our website for the Empty Box campaign is emptyboxseat.org. And for those of you that were here earlier and saw the video, um, you can actually play a game where you take one of the 15 dictators that we have identified as not being worthy of attending the opening ceremonies and pick somewhere to send them, which is oddly satisfying. And then you can share that on social media. Um, we also, we have a petition um, and we love any, anyone who wants to join the campaign can add their name we do hope that this goes well beyond Tokyo. Um, yeah, thanks all plug. I suppose the No Rights No Games campaign is no rights no games uh, We've been a bit more quiet lately, but we are working sort of behind the scenes on things. Uh, we have a petition, I think it's close to 300,000 signatures. It's been up for a while, um, but I would recommend people go to that. Uh, secondly, the coalition that we refer to labor is also working on this to a certain extent, especially on, on the issue of sponsors. Uh, and thirdly, I think I'm professionally obligated to mention the 
website of my employer, New York Human Rights Project, so uhrp.org, which of course we do research and advocacy, but the research that is on the front page, transnational oppression, the detention of imams, for example, we decided that tomorrow, actually at 145, uh, take a look at that as well. But we're watching the numbers very closely, like all of our panels and partners. Right. Well, everyone, if you would like to learn more about the China Coalition, you can go to our website, which is on the screen at chinacoalition.org, um, and you can get in contact with me there if your organization is interested in joining in, a, in any of our campaigns or becoming an official participant on our website. And so I want to thank all of our lovely panelists. Thank you for a great discussion, and thank you all for coming today.